Hi, hello, online people. Hope you all are doing great. Appreciate the coffee this morning. Appreciate the donuts this morning. Um, Phil Young is here, and we'll, uh, the Dupree's are still gone, so they, Phil Young will be uh, taking up the collection later. There are, as there are every week, nearly, thanks to the Beals, I guess every week, period. Thanks to the Beals, there are three red boxes, one, two, three, uh, to register your presence, and please do that. And if you are not on the class roster, um, you should be. So write your name and email address, and Connie will get you added to it at the first opportunity. And as I've explained before, the way that the name tags are working now is that when you, when you get a name tag from the board or you get a new one from Connie, please just keep it yourself. Don't put it back on the board. Just take it home. Take care of it yourself. We're moving away from the name tag boards. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do it ourselves, by golly. And we can do that. There are also three Joys and Concerns notebooks. One for each section of the room. Please read, please move those back and write down any joys and concerns you would like to have lifted up at the end of class today by uh, Patty. So, let's see. What do I have in the way of announcements today? This week is the United Methodist Men. Um, what do they call it? Sweetheart. Sweetheart Dinner and Movie. Um, on this Friday, the movie's a proposal. You can register and pay online in Realm. If you have problems with that, reach out to me or to Connie directly because all I will do is forward your email, forward your email about the problem to Connie um, Robertson. But if you don't know how to reach Connie, send it to me. And um, tomorrow, I think, I think Mike told me that Feb 7th is the last day to register. Right, Mike? See? Locked away. Still trap up here. Yeah, right. Very, it's a very rusted still trap at this point. Okay, so that's coming up this week. <clears throat> also, tomorrow at 3 o'clock, you know, every Monday at 3 o'clock I teach an online class. And we have people who join us live. We have lots of people who listen to the podcast on their own schedule. We have lots of people who watch it on YouTube, because I also record it and put it up on YouTube. But we're going to start to Isaiah tomorrow. Now, I've been asked to do Isaiah many times over the years. Never really felt I was ready. I don't know why I'm doing it now. I don't know. Uh, if you ask me, well, Scott, what has changed? I would say, I don't know. Maybe I'm just getting weak or something. But anyway, so I said, yes, yes, yes. So we're going to start Isaiah. Tomorrow it is... Um, the, I think it's fair to say it is the most important Old Testament book for the shaping of Christian theology. It is quoted a lot in the New Testament. It is alluded to a lot in the Old Testament um, when it comes to understanding what God, um, the God's great promises that come to fruition in Jesus. So that is coming up. Um, we're going to start that tomorrow at 3 o'clock on Facebook Live, like always, like we've been doing for two years now. Can you believe it? Wow. March 12th this year will be the second anniversary of that last social we had before we all scurried into our caves like little bats hiding out. It's, it's really hard to comprehend. I mean, it's hard for a person my age to comprehend it, the sad thing is for, for the kids and, and stuff, it's such a large percentage of the time they have lived. Really, it's just, just mind-blowing. So now along those lines, I have a change. So you're, I'm going to show you the slide, and then I'm going to explain to you what the truth really is, okay? <laughs> don't Scott, you love that? Scott, I do have to stop you for one second. Yes? I don't know if there's anybody up in the booth, but online they're hearing Scott incredibly incredibly low, low, low sound. Okay, so online folks, well, it won't help they for me are to speak working up then, on so the they're sound. Working on it. I will try to enunciate Thank clearly you. so you can read my lips if you're online. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> that won't work well. They, they can hear you very faintly no matter how up, mm. how up the volume okay. they do. Okay. Yeah. okay, well, hopefully that'll get fixed. Oh, Facebook Live, we love you. So, um, okay. 
So on February 20th, we do not have this room because the prom closet is going to need it. And last week, I was just was back in my old long time ago frame of mind and said, okay, we're, we're just not going to be able to have class on the 20th. But then Patty reminded me, Scott, you know we can do this online. We've done it for two years. So actually on February 20th, what's going to happen is we're going to do class. I'm going to do it online like I did for the entire pandemic when we were all hiding out. If you can participate, it's great. Um, if you can't participate at 11 o'clock, then it will be on YouTube and you could view it later on, at, on your own time. So it'll be just like it was when we, for a year and a half, that's all we were doing was online. So that makes more sense, right, Patty? Absolutely. Absolutely, okay. We good? Any questions about that? All right, well, Patty, what do you have for us today? Well, you know, I was a little worried this morning because I did not find my... Better speak up if you want them to hear you out there in the world. Sorry. Yeah, this morning I was a little worried because I couldn't find my national calendar day today, but I went to another source and I was happily to, you know, find that I was able to bring it up. So today is National Pay a Compliment Day, National Frozen Yogurt Day, it is Bob Marley's birthday, Remembrance Day. It is Ronald Reagan's birthday. And if you ever want to hear a really funny story, you give me a margarita, I will tell you my Ronald Reagan story. It's great, isn't it? It is worth a margarita, I promise. <laughs> it's going to take two, let me tell you right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I loved Ronald Reagan. I'll just say that right there. <laughs> I know you did, darling. <laughs> I had an almost close encounter with him, almost. And also, it's National Pork Rind Appreciation Day. Remember that one. I haven't appreciated pork rinds since I was about 12, but yeah. I do remember them fondly. Yeah. And what other day is it today, Scott? It's today, it's a national day. It's a day of great national celebration because it is the eve of Patty's birthday. Yay! <laughs> and to top it off, today is actually Larry Phillips' birthday. Oh, yay! Happy birthday, Larry. So, yeah. Yeah, so we've been celebrating Patty's birthday for a, for a while now, haven't yes. we, dear? Yes. 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 Kind of what we do, isn't I it? I asked you if we could do what Kathy Sutherland's husband does. He changes the name of October, and it becomes Pathtober. So the whole month. And I asked you if maybe we could do that. And we were trying to come up with a Patty Brewery. <laughs> Pat Brewery, yeah. Something like that. Yeah, sure, it would yeah. work. It would work. So, well, thank you, Patty. Anything else? Nope, we're good. Okay, I don't think I have any other announcements I need to make. Don't forget. Yes. Oh, okay, yes, thank you, thank you. See, I have such, my, my memory is shortened to nothing. Okay, so just so you know, some of us get um, emails from Robert that are hacks, where he is asking you to come all, go off and do a favor for him. I get a couple a month. I think it must be because of his title on the web or something. And, and so just know that that's what, that's what that is. So, so Judy got one. Just, just ignore him. If he wants you to, if he wants a favor from you, he will call you about it and let you know. He doesn't email anyway. So, okay. So let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are grateful to be here today. We are grateful as always for the gift of your Holy Spirit, and we pray as we return to the Sermon on the Mount today that you will open our eyes and our ears. To Jesus' teachings. Help us to help us to hear him well. Help us to grasp the life he has called us to. Help us to grasp what it really means when he announces the coming of the kingdom of God. Help us to grasp that really in and through Jesus everything has changed. Everything is different. And we pray that your spirit would lead us to a deeper understanding of all this. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Okay, friends, so we are today going to talk about the Sermon on the Mount, part two. Last week, we talked about the Beatitudes, right? And we talked about the Beatitudes not simply being, you know, little, though I, I hear this all the time, little Beatitudes, like what's your attitude ought to be every day? No, it's talking about the arrival of the kingdom of God because if you went back a couple of weeks ago in here, we talked about Jesus' keynote speeches <laughs> in which he announced the arrival of the kingdom of God. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom is, is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. One foundational statement we as Christians make is that everything changed with the incarnation, with the arrival of Jesus, with his birth, his death, his resurrection. That marked the climax of human history. We now live in a time, yes, when the age of sin and death is with us, but we also live in the time of God, in the, in, 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 in the kingdom of God, in the, in the age to come, as the Jews called it. Both, both are here, and we are in these in-between times. And that's just so important to grasp. So when he, when, when, when he was um, expressing the Beatitudes, what we call the Beatitudes, to his disciples, he is, he is helping them grasp the nature of the kingdom. And in the kingdom, there aren't any meek. And there is no mourning and the rest of it, okay? So the sermon goes on, but that context of the coming of the kingdom, right, is the context in which you view everything Jesus says and everything he does. And I grant you, we are in the Sermon on the Mount, um, so we're very much focused on what he says. Next week, we're going to be very much focused on what he does. And you can't elevate one above the other, okay? Right? So, as I've said many times, you have a red-letter Bible if you want one, but I don't really recommend it because it, le it wires your brain to think that what he says is more important than what he does. And we know that's not true. So I thought today... With the Sermon on the Mount, we would talk about it. And so I opened my Bible, and I said, okay, we're going to talk about the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to build this triangle. And, we're gonna ta and I, I figured what I would do is I would take all the little topics that Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount, and I would put them all on this triangle. So I started that project. I created this. And that was only about half done. And I said, well, by goodness, if I put all the stuff inside that triangle, nobody's going to be able to read it. So <laughs> I just really picked out certain highlights because what I, what I want you to grasp in the sermon, it, you know, in a way you could say it defies structure, but it, it doesn't really because surely it's not an accident that Matthew puts Jesus' teachings about prayer at the center of it. Because I'm sure that for Matthew, Jesus' teachings were centered upon prayer. How many times in the Gospels do we find that Jesus withdraws from the crowd to go away and simply to pray, to be alone, to pray, to, to sort of step away from the chaos and busyness and that was thrust upon him by the crowds and step back in so that he could breathe and, 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 and refocus on the Father and his vocation in a time of prayer. So I think that prayer, it's, it's, it, it doesn't surprise me that it's at the center of the Sermon on the Mount. So here's how the sermon, so we're just going to kind of walk up one side and down the other. Okay? Seems as good a way as any on this Sunday. So... Beatitudes we talked about last week, not talking about those again. Salt and light. You know, we get used to hearing about this because we have a salt and light choir, right? But the deal is that I don't think people really, really grasp the connection here. We are called to be the salt of the earth, right? And, and um, salt, give, salt gives life. You and I don't have to um, go out and compete for salt. Um, it's readily available. But you need salt to live. If you don't have salt in your diet, you would die. 
right? So um, our problem is usually my hour. I make it our problem. It's really my problem. <laughs> my problem is I often have too much sodium, too much salt in the course of a day because I like, I'm not a sweet eater so much. I'm not one to sit around and munch on fudge or something, you know. Well, Samoas, yeah, this time of year, Samoas, yes, okay. But I like salty snacks. I like, you know, like little combos and salty chips and stuff like that. But anyway, so salt gives life, right? And, and salt gives flavor in, to things. But what has always intrigued me is the fact that Jesus tells his disciples to be the light of the world, to be that city on the hill, not to hide their bushel basket, uh, to hide their light under a bushel basket. One of the great I am statements of Jesus in John's gospel is, he says, I am the light of the world. He says about himself, I am the light of the world. And he tells his disciples, you are the light of the world. Why? Which is it? It's not, it's not a choice to be made. The truth is, that Jesus' vocation blends with our own vocation. Jesus came, right, to rescue humanity, to, to be faithful all the way to death, even death on a cross. Our vocation is to carry the news of that out to the world so that others, Gentiles, everybody included, would come to Jesus and embrace what Jesus has done for them. So, as... Preachers are very fond of saying we are the hands and feet and eyes of Jesus right now, today. And so, sure, we're to be the light of the world. That's a perfect way to begin to, to get further into this, into this Sermon on the Mount. And then, after that, he goes into about a half a dozen or so passages like this one. That's a funny little fellow there, isn't he? Yeah, you see him on the, if you prowl around the internet, he's, he's, he's like everywhere. He, I get, I don't know why I say, she, I don't know. <laughs> do not, so Jesus says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not co come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So for much of my life as a Christian in the church, this is the kind of verse I just would have skipped over. Because it made no sense to me. Because what I was basically taught, what was preached to me over many years, was that Jesus came to get rid of the law, get rid of all those requirements for what it takes to get into heaven, and just so we can just embrace Jesus and all is good. And then you would come across Matthew 5, 17. And what does, what does the man himself say? Do not think that I have come to abolish the law. I have come to fulfill it. And then later on, when you read in the Gospels, what does he do a lot of? He does a lot of quoting from the law when he's challenged about what is the great commandment. What's his answer? Love God. Deuteronomy 6, love others. Leviticus 19, and you come to comprehend that Jesus didn't come to sweep God's teachings about how we are to live out the window. Why would he do that? Right? He came, as Arthur said in his sermon today, to take him to a deeper level. Right? Because as he says in one of these passages, it's really great. I mean, it's really super duper that you haven't murdered anybody. Thumbs up to you. But you know, if you're angry with your brother or your sister or your neighbor, That, that's not what love is. That's not what love does. Right? Because we, what do we do? We tend to nurture anger. We let it grow. and We let it drive us apart. You know, there are people who get estranged from one another because of something that happens. And they're, they're mad about it at the moment. And 20 years later, 30 years later, they're still estranged and they can't even tell you why anymore because it's lost. The truth of it's lost, you know, in the pages of time. That's how it is. So, so Jesus, Jesus came to fulfill the law. Paul called the law 
the Old Testament law, a nanny. A nanny. Have you ever seen an episode of Super Nanny? <laughs> really, they're pretty entertaining. I have watched a, a couple of them. Y yeah, yeah, you probably needed the Super Nanny. <laughs> so the Super Nanny, there's, some, there's always some family who has kids out of control. And the Super Nanny swoops in and she installs a system and some rules and stuff that get the kids under control by the end of the hour. And I always wonder, like, Okay, really, what happens when she goes home, right? So anyway, I don't know why I'm, I'm talking about it because we're talking about nannies. So, so Paul said the law was like a nanny, that, that God's people needed the, needed the whole system of the law and the whole structure of it all to, in order to teach them, to help them, to control them. But now in Jesus, the need for a nanny has gone. It doesn't mean the nanny was a bad thing didn't mean the law was a bad thing. It didn't mean you couldn't learn lessons from the nanny. But you didn't need the nanny anymore to be um, your guide. You could be your guide. You're an adult now, Paul would say, right? So, the law. So, in the sermon, Jesus devotes almost all of a good bit of chapter 5 to, the, to this discussion of the law, such as this one. Love your enemies. Okay? And pray for those who persecute you so that you may be... Son oh, let me just look at it here. I can't turn around and read all that. Okay. Yes, I know. What did he say? He said, yes, I can. Okay. Let me just read the whole passage. I'm going to read it from the NRSB. He says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. Remember, tax collectors were despised by the Jews generally as sellouts to the Romans. So, you know, really, if you love the people who love you, great. Who doesn't? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than everybody else? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore as your heavenly Father is perfect. So, let's take that apart for just, for just a minute. Jesus takes the basic structure of, of, of the commandment to love and helps people grasp that it encompasses their enemies. And he does it here in words by saying that, well, you know, really, I mean, it's easy to love those who love you, but you have to love the people your enemies. And a, then he tells a parable much later about a good Samaritan. Right? You know, the, everybody knows. It's the most well-known parable of Jesus, even outside Christian circles, the parable of the Samaritan. So I'm not going to retell it all. The parable of the Samaritan is a parable about, about coming to the aid um, of, an, of an enemy of understanding who your neighbor is because the one who ends up rendering aid to the man beaten up for dead, lying on the side of the road, passed by the Levite, passed by the priest, that person, the one who renders the aid, goes over the top. In doing so is a Samaritan. And the Samaritans despise the Jews and the Jews despise the Samaritans. And the Samaritan is the one who showed what love is. Love is not what you feel. Love is what you do. How do you treat your enemies? How do you treat the people who have offended you? How do you treat the people who have wronged you? Is your first thing to slap them if they slap you? Well, that's an instinct that, that we need to get past. That's not Jesus' instinct. 
So in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has this passage he talks about, oaths he talks about, adultery he talks about, anger he talks about, divorce, he talks about retaliation. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That comes from the law of Moses, Exodus. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. If anyone strikes you, do the right strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your cloak, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go a second mile. Each of those are specific things tied to the occupation imposed upon them at the time by the Romans and the requirements that they placed upon the Jews. And though we don't live in those times, we still get the point. Does it, I heard N.T. Wright talk about this one time. He says, does it mean that you have to just be some kind of doormat, right? And, and N.T. Wright said, no, you don't have to be some kind of doormat. But our problem is this. We, 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 real, we retaliate out of all measures of proportion. We do live in a world filled with sin. And we do seek vengeance. And, and those vengeance is something left to God. It's not something for us to hold in our hearts. And so Jesus leads his disciples down this road of understanding what it really means to be God's people and to be God's kingdom people. So, then you get to this statement. I don't, I, I don't know if Arthur talked about this. He got such a late start today with the sermon. I couldn't, I couldn't hear it all. But he said, um, be perfect. Jesus famously, famously says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So that word perfect doesn't it kind of throw us a little bit? I mean, really? Like, perfect? Perfect? Really? Perfect? So the word in the Greek is telos, and what it means is whole, complete, mature. So be whole, complete, mature, as your Father in heaven is. It is, it is a goal, okay? Um, and... Uh, we, we, we read it too quickly as, well, I'm going to be perfect, and that means I can't do anything wrong, as opposed to reading it, I'm supposed to be a mature, whole, complete disciple of Jesus. Not focusing on the things I shouldn't be, which is easy for us, but to focus on the things that I should be doing. I think that's a much better way to understand what Jesus means here at the end of chapter 5 in Matthew and is something that I can grasp more easily than the be perfect part, which I don't think is a very, it's, it's not the best translation, but we keep it because it's um, just so traditional. So, all right. So let me, um, then we come to the, top of the triangle and as Arthur laid out today it begins with almsgiving okay um, I have a let me just check my, my slides here it begins let me go back in fact let me go back to the triangle I should have put it in a couple other places it begins with almsgiving. See, right at the top, you have the, the, the admonition about alms, about, you know, in their world, there's no, there's no social safety net. So alms was the way that you helped take care of people in need. And as Arthur did a great job in his sermon today, just saying, look, it's about the heart again. It is about not doing it so that other people see it. And there's several places, stories in, in the Bible where people are very public about doing it because they want everybody to see all the wonderful things that they're doing. Jesus says, nope, 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 it's about the heart. It's like the murder and the versus the anger stuff, right? It's about your heart. And then he talks about prayer in the Lord's Prayer and talks about don't be a hypocrite, don't pray so that everybody can see what a wonderful prayer you are. Gosh, 
you know, a few to- for a while, Patty and I, okay, some of you grew up Baptist, right? How many people here grew up in a Baptist church? Okay, I did not grow up in a Baptist church. I grew up in an Episcopalian church. That is, they are pretty far apart in a lot of ways. So when I first started going to a Baptist church or getting exposure to it, I was a little intimidated because people would get in this circle, right? They're all going to hold hands or something, and they're going to start praying, and they're going to go around the circle, and everybody's going to pray out loud with some spontaneous, heartfelt, spirit-filled prayer directly from God's mouth through theirs. <laughs> And I said, whoa, I grew up Episcopalian. We did not do these kind of things, okay? It was very intimidating. It was so intimidating that I wouldn't even pay attention to what we were praying the whole time. I was trying to think about what am I going to say? What am I going to say? And boy, it's really going to be lousy compared to all these other prayers from practiced people, okay? Somewhere in that, at least for me, was, was a lesson, okay, that I should not worry about what I pray. I should just pray. I need to be careful about, I've gotten much better at praying in, in public, but I should never let myself fall into the feeling that I want to make a show out of it. Or I want to have the most beautifully constructed prayer that anybody ever heard. And we'll touch everybody's heart really deep and so forth and so on. Because then I don't make it about the prayer. I make it about the show. This is at least true for me. I'm not going to suck any of the rest of you into my, you know, my need for therapy or whatever. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so he, Jesus warns his disciples, don't be hypocrites about this stuff. Don't do this because... You want people to see what a wonderful prayer you are. That's not it. Just keep it simple. Um, Richard Foster has great examples in his book about prayer of just, you know, get more comfortable with the view of prayer as being you, you stepping into, for me, it would be my grandfather's room and sitting in a chair and unburdening myself and having a conversation with my grandfather. And just approachable and easy and genuine and real. Another piece of, uh, that's one piece of advice. Another piece of advice I can give you that is super duper. Did I say super duper? Yes, I did. Okay, is to pray the Psalms. The so- we, people misunderstand what the Psalms are. I think, well, again... I misunderstood the Psalms for a long time. You see, this is, what, this is what we preachers and teachers do. You get sucked into all my problems. So I misunderstood the Psalms for a long time. I would go to the Psalms thinking that when I read a Psalm or prayed over a Psalm, which I did once in a while, that it would be, it was so it could express my heart. Right? So it would be expressing my heart. So I would expressing my gratitude or something else. No, that's not what the Psalms are about. The Psalms are not about expressing your heart. They are about shaping your heart because our hearts are misshapen. And the Psalms are this prayer book that is thousands of years old, used by Jews and Christians to help. It's one of the important means by which our hearts are shaped reshaped put back put into a, put into put into a god shape so don't think that the prayer has to express whatever you're feeling that the psalm has to express whatever you're feeling at the time no pray over the psalm and let it let it begin to shape to shape your heart that's another i think good piece of advice Another piece of advice I can give you about prayer, as I go back to the Lord's Prayer here, is to, wow, I had a lot of slides there, didn't I? Oh, I'm going backwards. (laughs) I, okay. I've talked about this before. It would be a 
very powerful thing if we all said grace around the table together in public. That if you go out to dinner at McGuire's or wherever you like to go to dinner, that before the meal is served, somebody says a word of grace. Even better, you hold hands around the table and say a word of grace. It is a powerful, powerful witness. I'm, and I'm telling you, I grew up with an aversion to it. We would say grace at home, but as the, I'm, I don't know where this all came from. I, like I said, I needed therapy. But I, I remember I worked with some Baptists, and, and, and they would pray at lunchtime. We'd go out for lunch once in a while. I didn't go out much for lunch. I don't, my, but anyway, we, we, we'd go out for lunch. And somebody would say a prayer. And I can remember one time this one gal, she kind of put her hand on my arm. She said, Scott, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Because I was kind of like getting kind of nervous or something. I don't know. <laughs> and then it was suggested to us, Patty and me, when we were in a covenant group here at the church. I'll tell you who did it. Buy Bobby Flowers. And she said, you know what you should do? You should say grace at every meal. Do it at home. Do it in public. So now we do. And you know what? We have had wait staff come over to us and thank us for praying just a, not anything big. We just, uh, grace doesn't, we don't go on and on. It's just a simple word of grace. That's all. Just a simple little blessing over the meal. Has come over and said, thank you for doing that. Because it's a small Christian witness. And I just think to myself, how powerful would it be if we all did that in a small, grace-filled way? You see, because that's, that's what prayer is. So when um, Eugene Peterson in the message renders it as, as Jesus is saying, just keep it simple. Here we go. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, which does mean let the world know who you are. Reveal yourself to the world. That's what that little phrase is, is really, that's what, it, that's what it really means. And the prayer goes on. It is a simple prayer, right? You're praying for forgiveness. You're praying that you will have a heart that will forgive those who have wronged you in some way. You're, you're praying thanks for your daily bread, right? You're praying that, that God will give you the strength to avoid, um, to resist, not avoid, but that's impossible, that to resist temptation. And in Matthew, sure enough, it speaks not of evil in some grand sense, but the evil one. Right? And um, I, I think you should not view the Lord's Prayer as being apart from belief in the evil one. It's just there in, in, in Matthew. And so, sure. And... Just, just let that become a sort of a foundational, simple prayer that we do pray in here weekly. You at the church, we, you could pray it daily. Patty and I do pray it every day. Um, we try not to do it by rote. It's easy for things to begin to be to to do it by rote. So, how do you avoid things becoming rote? Um, and I'll tell you. Okay. Don't tell anybody else this, as I speak to a room of all, all these people in the world. Sometimes we at St. Andrew, our pastors pray it too quickly. It's too fast. It's too quick, um, in my opinion, and Patty's opinion. <laughs> so so one, way, one way to begin to break that mold for yourself is to purposely go at a pace it seems kind of slow, take a breath en route, and emphasize different words. You see, that, that's a real good meditative technique. You can do a really good meditative technique is to take a very short piece of Scripture or, you know, something as short as God saves us and, and meditate over it and pray over it and then say it, God saves us. God saves us. God saves us. And the difference in emphasis 
helps you to grasp different meanings of the same words. And you can do that in the Lord's Prayer. Right? And, and so I'm, I'm just saying there are a lot of ways to keep the Lord's Prayer becoming from becoming just this rote thing that you've heard a million times. You're going to say a million times more. And instead, stay tuned in to what it means. Okay? So, before I go on with a couple things from the second half of the triangle, any thoughts or questions? Philip. Uh huh. People almost. So, what if you can't hear Phil? Phil's saying he has a Baptist friend. When they go out for lunch, the Baptist friend asks the wait staff, Is there, Can we pray for you? And without fail, they say yes. Yeah. That is generally what happens. When you ask people, it's not like they're offended or anything, they will say yes. Right? And so that would be a good practice. That's a whole nother level up for this Episcopalian from where I am today. <laughs> so, but maybe we'll, maybe we'll give it a try. So, yeah. But have, um, some of you have probably, this has been my experience, I have had um, surgeons who will ask me, Do you, would you like me to pray over you? Right? And, and so that's always a very powerful thing when the surgeon before you're going in um, because it's in, in my experience it was unexpected that the surgeon or the doctor w would ask me if, if he or she could pray over me before they <laughs> start digging into me or something right so there are a lot of ways to do that that are small things but it does require us to live a public faith right a public faith in a way that isn't going to draw us into endless debates, fruitless debates and fruitless arguments with people as Paul would talk about. But simply lets people see us as Christians. Okay, so let's just stick with this for a second. I don't know what else we'll get to today. So there is a clip on the internet of Stephen Colbert and somebody interviewing him, I don't know who she is, about his Christian faith, okay? And he said, I am a Christian, and, you know, I, I am Catholic, and, and she wanted to know something about how he puts together his comedy and his faith, and he, then he goes on, and he talks about his, the fact that we are mortal. And so thus, of course, his faith wins. If in his view there's ever a debate between the two. And he went on and he said these am uh, amazing things. And when he got to the end, he said, you know, I, I, I just hope that, you know, when I get to heaven, Jesus has a sense of humor. <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't know what you might think of Stephen Colbert or anything. I've never really paid much attention to Stephen Colbert. But it was a pretty surprising and I think very, pretty darn powerful witness from somebody in an unusual place in the world for Christians to be that way. So, in any event, any other questions? Yes, sir. Go back to that earlier Yes. You know what I'm asking. Yes. <laughs> you know those are the kinds of there's a strong 2,000 year old history in the Christian church of pacifism of simply saying no we don't use, divi we don't use violence even in the defense of justice and you can build a biblical case in the New Testament for that. Um, but it's not the only case you can build. Because it leads you to a place that makes you scratch your head. As in the parable of the Good Samaritan. When the guy is getting beaten to death. 
and the Samaritan comes upon him and the Samaritan has the means to stop the guy from getting killed, should the Samaritan use that means even if it entails violence? Can you use when, yes, I'm to love my neighbor, and, but what do I do when one neighbor is killing another neighbor? So it has, spins out all these kinds of questions about what you actually do. Um, and they're challenging, and there they're, they're, they're just are not easy answers to that. But I do hear Jesus, because most of us are not really confronted with those kind of questions. Jesus is saying that, yes, you are to love your enemies. You are to treat your enemies well. Okay, so, right? So, for example, what does it mean in a time of war to treat your enemies well? Right? How, does, how do you treat your prisoners of war? How do you... What kind of weapons do you use? And all kinds of questions that flow from it. And honestly, they're all really hard to answer. And um, a lot of issues about what is just war and what is not. And I'm never going to pretend that there are easy answers to it. And there are multiple strands in Christianity which need to respect one another that have arrived at different conclusions about those kind of questions. And we shouldn't think it's an the Bible doesn't speak with one voice. Jesus doesn't speak with one voice because he tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? Okay, so, okay, one more. You said when we speak for our house, we thy name. Yes. And what it means? Yes. It means reveal yourself. Hallowed be could because, again, name for us is a, na- is, is a label. Name is the, basically the person in the ancient world. It's like the best example I can come up with is, like in the ancient world, if, if someone told you their name, it would be like me revealing to you my social security number. It would, then what is that? <laughs> <laughs> She's got pen in hand ready to take it down. So I'm sure a I'm sure hundred people out there in the dark web have it right now. So... Um, yeah, so, so when, when Peterson, in the message, renders it as reveal yourself, basically, that is um, what that hallowed be thy name is, is really about. Um, because keeping God's name holy, it is, it, it is a public, it's a public idea, not a private. So let's look at a couple more just so you know. I mean, if I advise, maybe this week you could sit down with Matthew 5, 6, and 7 and just look at all of the pieces of things that are in there. There's so many well-known pieces of Jesus' teachings that Matthew pulls together into this Sermon on the Mount. No one can serve two masters. Okay? And yes... It's specifically no one can serve God and money or God and wealth, but broaden it out. No one can serve two masters. We have to make choices. Whom will we serve? Who gets first call on us and our lives and our priorities and our resources and our attention? Okay? Yes, we have jobs. And yes, we need to to work hard at those jobs and, and have careers and take care of our families and do all of that kind of stuff. But you can do all of that stuff and still understand who your master is. I used to, when I, when I was in business, I competed against the guy, not me personally, our, our firm competed against another firm. And the person who ran that firm used to give out thing, these things he called hustle cards. And he made it very clear that there was to be nothing in your life that was more important than your job at X company. He didn't want to hear about the, uh, the Little League baseball game. He didn't want to hear about the church camp out. He didn't want to hear about any of that. You were to hustle and you were to put the company's work ahead of everything else. You cannot serve two masters. Some people have to, sometimes in life we have to make choices, don't we? If you're in a situation where you feel like 
The company you're working for is making it impossible for you to, to, to put God first. Then you probably need to find another employer. And now's a pretty good time to do it, as a matter of fact. <laughs> right? The golden rule comes from the Sermon on the Mount. I don't think I even quite comprehended this. Right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, or whatever formulation you want. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. This sums up the law and the prophets. The, the fascinating part to me is the second piece of this. It's, it, it, it mirrors when Jesus says, I haven't come to abolish the law, but I've come to fulfill it. So now he says, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. That sums up all that Old Testament stuff. All that stuff the prophets wanted. That's what love is. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Treat others as the way you would have them treat you. That's, that's, that's what love is. You see, love in the Bible is about doing. This is, this is not a, 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 a statement about feeling, about your emotional state. It is about what you do, about what you do. To go to, this is where my head still is, that in, in a time of war, you would treat the POWs that you are holding the way that you would want your POWs to be treated, that the enemy has, right? I'm just, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And that sums up the law and the prophets, Jesus says. It's amazing, astounding. Here's more word, you know, more words again. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the only one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. This is a warning that is repeated over and over. It's easy to shout out, Lord, Lord. Easy to shout out, Lord, Lord. But where is your heart and where your heart is, that is revealed in what you do. That's the connection. So I often use the phrase two sides of a same coin, of a single coin. Because in a single coin, it has two sides, <laughs> right? So one side is, is, is trusting Jesus, putting your faith in Jesus, believing in Jesus. The other side is obeying Jesus. So you have the trust and obey. You have the two sides and you can't pull them apart. This is what I think many... A lot of Protestants sometimes forget because we are so focused rightly on God's grace and mercy, understanding quite well that we cannot make ourselves acceptable to God, we easily fall into the trap of thinking that what we do doesn't matter to God. Well, that makes no sense. Of course what we do matters to God. Read the New Testament from beginning to end. The two great commandments, love God, love others. This stuff is telling you what that means. It's not empty words. It's lived out in what you do. So two sides, one coin, one coin, one coin. And then Jesus finishes it up with what? Guess what? Another great little parable about doing. This is the one where there are two people. They're each going to build a home. And they're going to build it in, what, in, the, in the Near East. It's called a wadi. In our world, out in Phoenix, they call them washes. They're, they're dry until the storms come, when they fill up and wash away. And one person builds his house on sand. One person builds his house on stone. Well, guess which house is washed away? The one who builds on sand. What is the difference between the two? The one who builds on sand is the one who does what Jesus said. The doing, doing, doing. So, you, 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 you know, we as Christians can't ever let ourselves fall into the place of thinking that what we do doesn't matter. Of course it matters. It has to matter. It is bound up with our salvation. Because if you think that you can have a heart that loves God and puts your faith in God, but you have nothing to show for it, 
you don't, it isn't reflected in anything that you actually do, then you're kidding yourself. You're one of the people who says, Lord, Lord, and it's nice and it's great and it's wonderful, but no. When you come to Jesus, you will, it will be seen, it'll be seen in what you do. Paul, this is all over the Apostle Paul. So anyway, when you come to the sermon, remember the triangle. I invite you to maybe this week just sit down, open, open up a Bible, look at all the sections and the teachings that build up to the prayer and then all the ones that come after prayer, three chapters long. It's, um, it's a little wonder that the Sermon on the Mount has been so, so influential. So, okay, I didn't leave any more time. For questions today, did I? I ask if any. You want me to anything? I look at Patty because sometimes I, I could go to like twelve thirty. Okay. Yes. Well, okay, but just understand it's not complete, right? Oh, okay. But it's not complete because I couldn't get the I couldn't get the text small enough. So, so, but sure, I can send it out. An incomplete triangle. <laughs> because there's a lot of topics that aren't in the triangle because I, I knew if I fit them all in there, you wouldn't be able to read them on the screen. Or at least I didn't think we would. Okay. Yes. 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 Uh, you're asking for for me, okay? So yes, I do. I would define the greater good as fighting for justice, right? It is unjust what what is happening to whomever in in genocidal situations, the Uyghurs or whoever might be we might be talking about. And so, yes, I do, because I believe that we, I know that we live in a time when sin and death and still, are still with us, and they must be constrained, okay? So I'm not a pacifist. All, my only point is that people I respect as Bible people, one of whom is Richard Hayes, one of the outstanding Paul scholars of our time, is a pacifist, and he does it on the basis of Scripture, and what I respect about him is he acknowledges that he gets a free ride. That somebody is actually out there looking after him and his wife and his little girls and the rest of it. Okay. So, so, so I, I respect pacifists, but I'm not one of them. Pacifists who, whose pacifism is grounded in their understanding of Jesus' teachings. So, there you go. Anything else? Okay. Alrighty. It's all yours, Patty. Okay. You know, I can remember that very last uh, prayer we had in a big, close-by Baptist church, holding hands. We had done that about three or four times, and that night we went home and you said, we've got to find a new church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it just, you know, so like so many people, we end up at, you know, Methodist Church. You know, we have a lot of Catholic Baptist couples here, a lot of Episcopalian Baptist couples here. We got, we got all kinds of, this is a good, that's the Methodist way, the Via Medea, the middle way. Right, Patty? Yeah, because you yeah. actually married me who was a Catholic Baptist both. Yes, and I <laughs> threw some Episcopalian in there, yeah. and a lot, I've actually been part of the Methodist Church for decades, so... But I didn't become a bad... Anyway, I love everybody. All righty. <laughs> I'm going to sit down now and shut up. So... <laughs> before I got myself in trouble. No, you're good. Um, prayers uh, lifted up today for Robert's health. Continuing to pray that Robert's treatments and everything are working well for him. Prayers for Larry Phillips on his birthday today. Prayers for Connie Eldred's mom, Norma, as she moves to a new assisted living facility tomorrow. And we know that that can be tough. 
Um, there's a prayer from Carol Wilson. She was wishing me happy birthday today, and she was really sweet. She bought me a, a lovely gift, and then she said, there's one other little thing in there, and I couldn't help it. I had to open it, and look what it was. Oreos. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's all it takes with Patty. <laughs> As you say, I am a cheap date, and it's true. <laughs> cheap date, that's right. Bag of Oreos, we're good to go. Um, happy birthday this week, later in the week, to Mike Kelly on February 12th. Um, prayers for Calvin Colbert, 30-year-old, heart transplant today. Prayers for him and his medical staff for success. Um, there's a prayer of joy for Chase and Carolyn Alexander, the son and daughter-in-law of Cammie and Steve. They're expecting their first child in July. Uh, that's that's wonderful. So that was it. Unless anybody else has anything, it was kind of a short list today. Oh yes, okay. Beth. It's my 75th birthday. Not just any birthday. Wow. 75th wow, birthday. Wow, that's so cool. I call this my Beetle birthday because I'll be 64, and I've had Alexa play when I'm 64. Every time Scott walks in, he says, you're really stuck on that song right now, aren't you? Okay, bring on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Amir. Amir, okay. Anything Amir, in particular? Uh, Amir had surgery oh, in okay. the past few We're days. Praying, praying for Amir today. And Kathy? Absolutely. Safe travels for the Renner Middle School Choir, who's going to be traveling to San Antonio, and, and that they don't get in any trouble while they're there. Those eighth graders, I remember what that was like. <laughs> okay, let's close in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for your presence today as we study, God, the prayer that your son Jesus taught us to pray. We pray, God, that you would watch over and take care of each one of us, Lord, gathered here today. And not only ourselves, Lord, but our family, our loved ones, our friends. We know, God, that there are many more prayers in a group this size. And we just ask your Holy Spirit, Lord, to lift those prayers up to you right now. We pray, God, for an end to this COVID uh, pandemic. We just pray, God, that we are truly getting closer to an end. We pray, Lord, that you would just watch over and hold us close, God, in this, this full week that is coming up. We thank you, God, for the safety you protected us in this week with the storm. And we love you, Lord. We just thank you so much for the gift of your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, one reminder. Okay, so next week, normal, normal. We'll be here. The next week, this class will be online, but not in Smith Worship Center. Okay? Adios, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday.